Welcome to another episode of Curbside Consults, where we take a deep dive into the practice-changing research published in the New England Journal of Medicine. In today's podcast, we are joined by Dr. Dave Harrington to discuss yet another aspect of statistical analyses. But first of all, welcome back, Krista. We missed you while you were gone. I heard you had a great time at a conference in San Francisco. How was it? I certainly did. I was at the American College of Surgeons Clinical Congress in San Francisco. It was awesome. It was huge. There were surgeons from all over the world. There were thousands of people there. It was very overwhelming. A particularly proud moment was when our paper by Bill Moria et al. was launched at the opening ceremony. And as you know, it discusses surgeon burnout as well as discrimination. So that was pretty cool to see our names up there. Uh, But I also got to see the Golden Gate Bridge, and I went to Alcatraz, and here and there, you know, I went to a couple of talks, little lectures, things like that. But coming back, I did notice that Ahmad has grown something on his face. What's going on there, Ahmad? You're, of course, referring to the giant mustache I have on my face. Uh, As some of you may know, November is the month we take to recognize men's health, uh, be it prostate cancer, testicular cancer, or mental health. And uh, some of us express our awareness through growing facial hair. And that's what I've done. So if you see any sketchy guys with sketchy facial hair, throw them a buck because it may be for a good cause. Right. Okay. Very good. Should we get back to this podcast? Let's get down to business, guys. On this episode, we will explore one of the central themes in the analysis of outcomes in clinical trials, one which I am sure you will encounter in your interpretation of the meaning, importance, and applicability of a study's results, the survival analysis. Today, I have the pleasure of welcoming back to the studio our very own Dr. Dave Harrington, Professor Emeritus of Biostatistics and Statistics at the Harvard T.H. Chan School for Public Health. I'm excited to mine the mind of Dr. Harrington on this topic, as it has formed a central theme in his own research and teaching for a long time. Welcome, Dave. Thank you, Krista. Happy to be here. When we read a clinical research article, it's common to come across the concept of survival, But do we know what's really being measured? Is this category literal? Clinical trials, especially those in the area of cancer research, are some of the best examples we have to understand survival analyses. In a paper published in the October 31st issue of the journal, authors Pearl et al. investigate the clinical benefit of an FLT tyrosine kinase inhibitor, giltaritinib, in the treatment of patients with refractory or relapsed acute myeloid leukemia who have the tyrosine kinase mutation FLT3. This subset of patients present a challenge to treatment because having refractory disease or relapse following induction chemotherapy, they don't often respond to salvage chemotherapy. In this study, there were two primary endpoints, overall survival and complete remission. Let's look at these endpoints a little closer. Dave. When evaluating a clinical trial for the purposes of statistical analysis, how is survival defined? Survival is defined generically as the time to an event. It often refers to the time to death in studies of chronic diseases, but can be the time to any well-defined event, such as the time to disease progression or the time of treatment failure. The Giltaritinib study used a primary outcome of time to death. One of the secondary outcomes was event-free survival or time to relapse, lack of remission, or death. The authors call this time without treatment failure. The time to an event requires definitions not just of the event itself, but also of the time the clock starts, what statisticians call the origin. In randomized trials, the clock almost always starts at the time of randomization. When duration of remission is measured, however, as in leukemia trials, the clock starts at the date of documented response. I see. What kind of information do survival analyses give? Survival analyses allow the determination of whether the event of interest is delayed by one of the interventions. When the time to death is the primary endpoint, as in the Gilter Itnip study, survival analyses are used to determine if one of the interventions extends life. In that study, median survival, the time by which half of the patients would have died, was extended on the intervention arm by almost four months, from 5.6 to 9.3 months. This may not seem like much, but relapsed or refractory FLT3 mutated AML is an extremely aggressive cancer, and even small advances might be considered important. 
Median event-free survival was extended from 0.7 months to 2.8 months. In this study by Pearl et al., patient screening and selection took place over about two and a half years, from October 15th to February 2018. This means that in the analysis, time zero may represent different time points for each person. How then do you account for a staggered entry when calculating and comparing survival data? In a randomized trial, the eligibility requirements of the trial ensure that patients entering the trial all have approximately the same stage or extent of disease. While the patients may enter at different calendar times, they are assumed to enter at the same time in the course of their disease. So the origin for each patient is the time of randomization. Oh, I see. I get it. Okay. In any study, though, some patients will drop out or be lost to follow-up. So what effect do they have on the group's outcome? And how do we deal with the data they generated before they were no longer part of the study? Patients who are lost to follow-up fit into the category of censored event times. Their data are used up until the time they are no longer part of the trial by considering them at risk for an event right up until the time they are lost. So they are part of the denominator in any of the calculations. And what happens to the information of patients who make it all the way through the study, but without the event occurring? like those 38 patients still receiving gilteritinib therapy at the end of the study we're discussing. These patients are also considered censored. Their data is used in the denominator in all calculations for as long as they have been observed. That form of censoring is called administrative censoring and is simply present because the trial did not have sufficient follow-up. But in the design of a trial, how do you determine how long to wait for to measure your outcomes? In other words, how do you determine the length of time for follow-up? The statistical power of a survival analysis is determined by the number of observed events. There is a good intuitive reason for that. In a study of a chronic disease, where bad outcomes happen infrequently and several hundred participants are followed for, say, five years, a small handful of events is unlikely to be useful in determining the relative benefit of an intervention. In aggressive disease, 80 or 90 events in 100 patients followed for a year might be very meaningful and very informative. So when a power calculation for a survival study is done during the design stage, the statistician calculates how many events are needed for given power, and the participants are followed until the desired number of events have been observed. It is usually possible during the design to estimate how long the follow-up should be from previous studies. And can survival analyses be applied to retrospective data? For instance, if you were looking historically at a time to event, such as death using hospital records or death registry files. Yes, it is possible to use survival methods with retrospective data, but special care must be taken. The event of interest, death, say, or disease progression, is usually clear and well-defined, but the time origin is more difficult and subject to potential bias. In hospital-based records, admission or diagnosis dates are appealing origins, but patients without adequate access to medical care may be admitted or diagnosed later than those with adequate access. If patients without adequate access both have events more rapidly and are treated differently, it may appear that the treatment used may be the reason for the more frequent events when, in fact, it's the presence of later stage disease. So later stage disease could be a confounding factor in those instances. The best solution is to define an origin time that will be associated with a similar stage of disease among patients included in the retrospective study. The problem of a well-defined origin time is mitigated in a randomized trial where the eligibility requirements of the trial usually ensure that patients are enrolled and randomized at similar stages of disease, as we mentioned earlier. Finally, since the randomization balances measured and unmeasured confounders, an assumed treatment association can assume to be causal. Record studies or retrospective studies cannot eliminate confounders, so differences in interventions can only be assumed to be associations. I see. So, Dave, I've heard a lot about the Kaplan-Meier method. It seems to be central to many studies and to this type of statistical analysis. So, what is the Kaplan-Meier method? The Kaplan-Meier method is an approach to estimating the proportion of patients who have not had an event at each follow-up time and is used to calculate the survival or event time curves or distributions that are in so many figures in the New England Journal. Since at any time point, a cohort of patients being followed is a mix of patients who have had an event, those who will have had an event in the future, and patients who have dropped out of the study, 
it is not quite as straightforward as a simple proportion. The calculations are not difficult, however, and the method has been widely used since Kaplan and Meyer proposed it in 1958. The Kaplan Meyer curves for the gilderitinib study and salvage chemotherapy arms are shown in Figure 2a in the paper we have been discussing. The curves show, for instance, that at three months after randomization, approximately 80% of the salvage chemotherapy patients were alive, while approximately 85% of the gilteritinib patients were alive. By nine months, the corresponding figures were 30% and 55% respectively, and that was a very large difference. Since the Kaplan-Meier curves provide a visual representation of a more complicated table that would show survival percentages at all possible times, they are often the first thing that readers turn to. Most definitely. We always go to look at the survival curves, but oftentimes we have no idea what they're really showing, so thank you for that. What other methods are used with survival data? The other widely used method with survival data is the proportional hazards model, often called the Cox model, after Sir David Cox, who proposed it in 1972. The Cox model is used to estimate event rates in each intervention group. Event rates are the rate per unit time that events are happening. So if 100 patients are followed for a year and 10 have an event, the event rate is 10 events per 100 participants per year. 10 events per 100 people is the same as 0.1 event per person, and these events are also called the hazard rates. The ratio of event rates between two groups is called the hazard ratio, and that value often appears in a plot of survival curves. In the Pearl paper, the hazard ratio was 0.64, So the gilteritinib patients were dying at approximately 64% of the rate of the salvage chemotherapy group. That is often summarized by saying that gilteritinib reduced the death rate by 36%. The Cox model can also be used to adjust for confounders in the same way that linear regression or logistic regression is used. And if these analyses look at time to event, by definition, how do we account for recurrent events? Special models are used to estimate treatment effects when there are recurrent events, such as tumor recurrences after surgery and superficial bladder cancer, or repeated revascularizations in cardiovascular disease. These analyses estimate and compare the rates at which events are happening. And can you use this curve to extrapolate a clinical prognosis or to estimate prognosis for a patient, say, when assessing the value of a study in guiding patient care? Yes, but only to a point. It's important to remember all summary statistics are essentially group averages, even Kaplan-Meier curves. So on average, a patient with relapsed, refractory, FLT3, mutated AML will have a better prognosis with the gilteritinib treatment. But that does not mean it is necessarily appropriate for every patient. In the absence of very detailed biological information on the effect of a treatment on a patient, however, it is certainly best to play the odds in choosing the treatment that is, on average, better. This has been very informative, Dave. Thank you. But finally, as in any paper, let's discuss biases and limitations. What are some of the biases and limitations to be aware of in a survival analysis? Bias can arise when censoring depends on the outcome. For instance, if patients who drop out of a study have poor prognosis and drop out before their event, then the Kaplan-Meier curves and the Cox model will be biased. Studies with insufficient follow-up may not have enough events and be underpowered and consequently uninformative. In studies where events happen a long time in the future, such as in the study of early-stage breast cancer or the long-term effects of an anti-diabetic medication, survival analysis can only show event rate during the period of observation. Assuming that a survival curve will have the same basic shape, maybe decline at the same rate, for instance, is an example of extrapolation and should be avoided. In the Cox model, the calculation of hazard ratios assumes that event rates are in fact proportional throughout the follow-up period. That may not always be the case. The time in origin should always have a clear and verifiable definition. Fortunately, none of these possible weaknesses were evident in the Pearl paper. Thank you, Dr. Harrington. You've really cleared up a few things about this topic, and thank you for taking us through the paper in such detail. Surely this will make reading the next paper a little easier. So thank you again to Dr. Harrington and to our listening audience for tuning in. As always, we want your feedback. Please email us at resident360 at nejm.org or reach out to us via the NEJM Resident 360 website. I want to thank our production team here at Resident 360 
which includes Karen Buckley, Kyle Simmons, Mike Tomasis, Tim Vining, Scott Williams, and Kathy Stern. Special thanks to my co-fellows, Dr. Ahmad Zaheen and Dr. Ken Wu, and our NEJM Education Editor, Dr. O.P. Hamnevik. Again, I am Dr. Krista Nottage, NEJM Editorial Fellow, and this has been another episode of Curbside Consults. Please join us for our next installment, but until then, keep cruising those corridors and look out for a pull-up, pull-over curbside consult.